vanity that makes me want to read these haikus that I wrote every, every morning here, every day before class. I love them. If by breath alone I can be a bigger man, how ephemeral. <clears throat> uh, get, oops, I'm so sorry. Uh, this gets to the heart of the study of lungs. Um, lungs are um, have been a kind of an ephemeral organ uh, for uh, to anatomists uh, for much of human history. Um, They've grappled to understand what it is, why we are doing it, why are we bringing air into the body, and then expelling it. Um, prior to uh, our understanding, our our understanding of molecular theory, uh, it doesn't really seem like the air that we're breathing in is much different than the air we're breathing out. Um, so the fact that there is some sort of exchange happening uh, eluded most people. Um, so going back to our friend uh, Galen, and you might uh, take exception with me calling him a friend once we get to uh, the kidney chapter and I tell you what he did to monkeys to learn how kidneys worked. Um, he didn't quite get it right here. He thought there was... Uh, there, there were these essential elements to the universe, right? Earth, air, fire, and water. And uh, the body is composed uh, in equal parts of these different uh, elements. This is a, an Aristotelian concept. Um, and um, the breath was the process by which uh, the, the body uh, incorporated the, the element of coolness, um, air and coolness into the body to tame the heat of the fire. Um, and so the lungs uh, were, so he believed the heart was the origin of the heat, and uh, the lungs were this um, organ for attenuating that, modifying it, uh, keeping that heat under control. So I took... <clears throat> many centuries uh, for the thinking to be evolved. Um, Leonardo da Vinci uh, had a chance to actually look at some lung tissue, and he made these comments. So the substance of the lung is dilatable and extensible like the tinder made from a fungus, but it is spongy, and if you press it, it yields to the force which compresses it. And if the force is removed, it increases again to its original size. So hereby, uh, beginning to zero in on the fact that there is void space in this, in this material of the lung. There's negative space that can be compressed uh, and then refilled and returned to its original size. Um, it wasn't until this guy, William Harvey, uh, about 100 years after da Vinci, uh, that we begin to understand that the lungs are actually providing something beyond coolness to the body. Um, they, he believed it was some sort of nourishment uh, to the body, and this nourishment is being delivered to the blood, uh, via the lungs. So he doesn't quite understand oxygen and respiration uh, in a modern sense, but he does have some sort of uh, idea that uh, there, there is something vital that is being provided that is in the air uh, beyond the, the quality of coolness um, that is then being transferred to the blood. Not terribly distant from Galen's uh, understanding, uh, but certainly in evolution. So life and respiration are complementary. There's nothing living which does not breathe, nor anything which breathing does not live. Uh, 
So here by identifying the fact that there's something happening uh, during inhalation that um, is, is essential to life. Um, entering the modern age of pulmonology uh, was this gentleman here, William Osler. And Osler is, um, for, for any of you who are in any small measure interested in the history of medicine, Osler is definitely a, a titan. He's a giant. Um, and he uh, started uh, pulmonology back in the 19th century uh, due to his studies of tuberculosis. And back then, they called it thesiology. Um, tuberculosis was ravaging, ravaging uh, the, the Western world, both Europe and uh, the United States. Um, he, he founded this National Association for the Study and Prevention of Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, by the way, is not uh, a licked disease. It's uh, likely that nobody in here has it, um, but one-third of the planet's population is, uh, is likely infected with latent tuberculosis. And if a strain of tuberculosis, an antibiotic, antibiotic-resistant tuberculosis were to arise, uh, it could become a profoundly devastating pandemic uh, to the global population. So tuberculosis is not a solved problem by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, it has been uh, mostly eliminated from developed, uh, the developed world. All right. Um, <clears throat> Back in the early 20th century, uh, polio, poliomyelitis, was uh, just a devastating disease that was a de-innervation disease. Uh, it destroyed peripheral neurons and for these uh, and leading to muscle wasting. Um, this is what uh, got FDR and crippled him and eventually led to his, his death. Um, there were literally thousands of young people, young, healthy uh, individuals that were struck down by, uh, by polio. Uh, and the way they dealt with it was to stick these people on uh, ventilators. These were uh, iron lungs, negative pressure ventilators. And the first, uh, the first of which can be seen right here uh, with that nurse, that was the first iron lung ever produced. And basically, they got their whole body got stuck into these chambers. There was an airtight seal around their neck, and then they would have negative pressure in the chamber, which would kind of expand their body, thus sucking air into their lungs. And then positive pressure was applied, expelling air from their lungs. Their lungs worked. They just couldn't ventilate the muscles of the diaphragm and the, and the attendant musculature. Uh, was wasted. Thankfully, we now have the polio vaccine, and polio has to uh, the, the greatest extent been eradicated from the Western world. Um, it does still exist on the planet, though. It is not. Um, uh, so there was an outbreak in uh, what's that country we bombed? Afghanistan. There was a, a recent outbreak of polio in Afghanistan. Okay. So alveoli, <clears throat> uh, the, this is the basic functional unit of the lung. It's the location of gas exchange. Um, what's interesting about the lung is that there is 35 times the surface area in your lung than uh, the surface area of your body. These small, volumetrically small um, structures in the lung, the lungs, have far more surface area for the exchange of gas. The more surface area, uh, the more there's going to be um, landscape, turf, uh, across which you can get the exchange of blood. I'm going to take a moment uh, because of my, my intellectual curiosity is not going to permit me to, to pass by the opportunity to point out a fundamental um, property of uh, the physical universe that we live in. And 
that is, and I'm going to state it in the general and, give, and then give you some uh, specific examples. Um, it is a general principle of the universe that you can fit a theoretically uh, infinite n minus 1 dimensional surface inside a finite n dimensional surface. Whoa, got to complete back, slow down. 3. We'll say n equals 3. In this case, it does. n equals 3. Uh, what is a three-dimensional surface? It's a volume. And what is an n minus 1? n minus 1 is 2. A uh, two-dimensional surface is surface area. So you can fit, theoretically, an infinite surface area folded up and compacted inside of a finite uh, volume. All right, And this is the maximizing the surface area to volume ratio. But uh, in general, it can apply to any dimensionality. And it is this principle that guides so many, so many of the structures that you're going to see in biology. So if you want to be able to rationalize why something looks the way it does, one of the principles that's going to guide that is this one right here. So for example, why does a snowflake look the way it does? It's maximizing perimeter to surface area. All right, the, the having this extremely huge perimeter as it moves towards infinity in an extremely finite surface area. All right, so that's that's one example. Uh, surface area to volume is another. Um, there, you can talk about higher dimensionalities, uh, f f four and three dimensional. Uh, uh, interaction. So, for example, within a four-dimensional surface, we'll, we'll call the fourth dimension time, uh, in, a, in a finite time period, like from time zero to time one, just in a single moment, you can think of time as being a stack of three-dimensional surfaces. And how many time points is possible to fit between zero and one seconds? Okay, so you can think of an infinite number of possible three-dimensional surfaces that can fit within a finite four-dimensional surface. It's a, it's a profound, it's a profound organizing principle uh, to matter. And this is just one of the many examples uh, in the body. I could point them out all day long through all the lectures uh, if you're really thinking about it and applying that understanding. So, enough of that. <clears throat> uh, here is the respiratory system. And I put this up simply to uh, identify the functions of the respiratory system. Um, so if I were to ask you what those functions were, you would say, well, it's breathing. And what, well, what does that mean? Breathing means bringing air into the lungs. We call that ventilation. Uh, and then exchange of gas. So, uh, so movement of air to the exchange surfaces, that's ventilation. Gas exchange uh, across, the, uh, uh, across the membrane, the respiratory membrane. Uh, and then <clears throat> there's also uh, the protection of the uh, respiratory surfaces by the mucus elevator. Uh, phonation or the power of speech is also included uh, in this respiratory system. And <coughs> olfaction uh, is not possible without the movement of air across the olfactory bulbs in the nasal cavity. Um, there, there are actually uh, some endocrine uh, functions in the lung as well that I did not put on this slide. So um, let's start with the sense of smell. So here is uh, a picture of what would be John Luke Picard's face if you cut it off and looked inside his head. Uh, one of the things you notice here is um, oh, this thing this one doesn't work. Oh yeah, here. Uh, you notice these structures. What are these? Oh, they're labeled. You can you can just read the labels there. Uh, the concha, the turbinates, also called the turbinates. So I, I like this picture because uh, it shows how aptly named the turbinates are. Uh, it creates a turbulence in the air uh, at, that is flowing through the nose. Uh, by mixing up that air, it causes any kind of fine particulates uh, that, would not, that would not be good for the lungs. 
to adhere to the walls of the nasal mucosa, right, um, and uh, not be sucked down into the lungs. It also helps dissolve uh, any odorants. So when you smell, any odorants that are in the air are going to get uh, stuck into the mucus of the nasal cavity so you can smell them. Uh, and th this looks like a, a pretty amazingly labyrinthian nasal cavity, but quite frankly, if you were to look at the similar cross-section of the rostrum of a uh, seal, for example, you would be staggered at how amazingly intense uh, the nasal cavity is in those animals who have a far more developed uh, sense of smell. Uh, and it's not just smell in, in the sense that we uh, have talked about in terms of the olfactory bulb. It's also, um, I, I, I didn't talk about it in class, and you may not get it in a lot of anatomy textbooks, but there's actually a 13th cranial nerve. It's cranial nerve zero, uh, also called the terminal cranial nerve. It's often overlooked because in humans, it's extremely, extremely small and subtle. Uh, it it uh, comes out into the very most anterior portion of the nasal cavity, and they believe, it's hard to study because it is such a small esoteric nerve that is usually destroyed upon dissection, uh, but they believe that it is responsible for uh, stimulating, for, for detecting pheromones, uh, for detecting pheromones. So those chemicals that are released by uh, others of the same species um, that uh, trigger all kinds of deep emotional responses from one another in attraction and aversion. So <clears throat> these turbinates help uh, you to process these very, very tiny chemical cues in the environment. All right. The respiratory epithelium of the nasal cavity uh, is lined with this, uh, this ciliated, these columnar ciliated epithelial cells. <coughs> and this acts as the mucus elevator. It's going to filter out any particles of dust or junk floating around in the air, uh, fine particulate matter, and uh, any pathogens uh, that you may inhale. It also warms and moistens the air so that the, lung, the surface of the lung uh, is able to stay in the appropriate condition for gas exchange. All right. Um, and so here's a picture of that mucus elevator. Um, we see the, uh, here, here's the, the lamina propria, the connective tissue with the, uh, the ciliated columnar epithelial cells on top. Embedded in here are these um, mucus cells, or so-called goblet cells. Here's a close-up of them. These are what are producing the mucus. Uh, it's going to drop it out onto the surface of that trachea or, or wherever, nasal cavity. Um, and then <clears throat> that the ciliated epithelium are moving like this to kind of uh, swipe that mucousy layer all in one direction, which is basically towards the mouth and towards the nose. Uh, the external opening of the nose. The larynx. <clears throat> so um, the larynx is responsible for uh, making sound. And um, the, the glottis and its surrounding structures are the organs of that. Uh, there needs to be a, def a distinction made in the definitions here of phonation versus articulation. Phonation is the job of the larynx. You, you use your uh, larynx to phonate. Uh, articulation is the combination of phonation by the larynx and then modification of that sound by the, the tongue, the mouth, the nasal cavity, all these other facial structures uh, that change the sound. So for example, I will... I will uh, saying Mary had a little lamb without articulation and just phonation. That would sound like... Uh, 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 like everything else is not moving and I'm just phonating. That's the phonation. And then articulation is turning that phonation, that is the underlying sound, into the speech that we now recognize. 
<clears throat> how do the muscles of um, the larynx achieve this? Well, uh, we're not going to go into the names of the muscles at all. That's way beyond our scope. But um, they are able, here are some muscles, they are able to pull on these arytenoid cartilages. So here's the, the thyroid cartilage, here's the cricoid cartilage. These little uh, rabbit ears, I call them in lab, are um, the arytenoids. Uh, the vocal ligament stretches from uh, the, uh, the tip of the arytenoid uh, to the anterior portion of the thyroid cartilage. These muscles on the side here uh, pull, and in so doing, uh, rotate. The, so they pull backwards. There's a fulcrum here. Uh, and uh, pull the two tips of the arytenoids together, tightening the uh, vocal cord as air passes through. And then there are other muscles back here that have the contrary uh, action and rotate the arytenoids out in the other direction, opening the vocal fold. Um, okay, so the anatomy of the trachea, I should have probably cut this slide out because that's, we did that in the lab. Uh, but here we are. So we're taking a cross section of the trachea and <clears throat> when we look at it, <clears throat> here's a uh, really beautiful colorized scanning electron micrograph where we can see the opening of these goblet cells uh, that are disgorging their vesicles of uh, mucus and then all these ciliated epithelium that are forming the same mucus, or they call it mucociliary uh, escalator that are bringing particulates that make it past the nose uh, up in, into, uh, up out of the larynx. Um, you can see why, so I showed you that skull in the earlier part of the semester of uh, what I thought was some sort of indigenous person from South America. And I said they probably died of pneumonia because they had poor dentition and a broken nose. They probably couldn't breathe through the nose. They weren't able to filter air. Uh, and uh, always breathing through the mouth led to poor oral hygiene. And uh, they probably had a much higher particulate load in their lungs than a typical person who could breathe through their nose would feel. All right, so <clears throat> the lung itself, <coughs> uh, the primary function of the lung is, of course, gas exchange, right? I mean, that's the thing that the lung does moment to moment without which we could not live more than, a, you know, five minutes or something like that. Um, Part of that is regulating the acid-base balance, the pH of your blood, by expelling CO2. Uh, it also helps us defend against any kind of foreign bodies that you may inhale, be they particles um, with a mucociliary escalator, elevator, whatever it is. Um, and it also is uh, full of antibodies and eosinophils. These eosinophils are actually the ones producing a lot of these antibodies. The IgE is uh, the isotype of immunoglobulin that uh, is produced by the eosinophils that we find in the lungs. Um, the lungs act as a massive reservoir of blood. About 20% uh, of your volume of blood is found in the lungs. That's a huge amount of blood. That's a huge amount. Um, <coughs> Uh, and then I, I had mentioned that it was a, uh, a location of endocrine function. So this is where we synthesize the leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are a, a category of hormone, uh, or cytokine is, is the word that's probably appropriate there, um, that are uh, that immunomodulatory compounds that uh, change... They, some of them can be pro-inflammatory, some of them can be anti-inflammatory, some can, you know, affect the different branches of your immune system. Uh, that gets uh, biosynthesized there. You also 
uh, can activate angiotensin there and break down uh, the lungs are where we break down the adrenal uh, the epinephrine pardon me and serotonin <clears throat> so uh, what does it look like see I had a model that used to look something like that I gotta find it um, so uh, the the a point I didn't make in the lab, which was brought up by one of you, uh, was what, why do we have three lobes of the lungs on the left and, and two on, or no, on, two on the left and three on the right? Uh, and those are uh, due to the secondary bronchi, bronchi uh, from the different branches of the lungs. Uh, they go into each of the lobes, and then we uh, subdivide that into lobules. Um, it is these... Um, secondary bronch, uh, secondary and tertiary bronchi, uh, which form the major, uh, are the major resistance that when you breathe in, you feel like you're working against something throughout that tidal volume of your breath. Uh, it is the expansion of those bronchi. They're the, they're the ones that are giving you the primary resistance to expansion. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, Oh, that's not the point that I'm making here, though. Pardon me. Um, uh, it's also these uh, these bronchi which are innervated by the autonomic nervous system and have smooth muscle which can contract uh, and give you bronchoconstriction or uh, bronchodilation and change uh, the resistance with uh, which you are feeling the, the movement of air through the lungs. Okay. Um, so the two terms that I just used will define them, bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. Uh, dilation just means an opening of uh, the lumen of one of these bronchi. Uh, and that is driven by the sympathetic nervous system. And why would you say that makes sense? Yeah. 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 So if, if you're, um, she, she said it. So bronchoconstriction uh, then being driven by the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, and that is the tightening of the lungs. And any, any parent of a small child uh, could, could tell you this. So when you go to bed, your parasympathetic uh, nervous system sort of takes over. Uh, and any child who has bronchitis gets, or the croup, it's called the croup in, in a very young child, gets much worse at night. They get much worse at night when they're having uh, parasympathetic uh, flow and uh, bronchoconstriction. And it's making a, a problem even worse. All right, bronchitis. It's just an inflammation of the bronchial wall. Uh, this can be due to <clears throat> a bacterial or viral infection. Um, however, it can also be caused uh, by chronic occlusive pulmonary disease, uh, COPD. So uh, there are about 10 million people in the country have COPD induced bronchitis um, and about 40,000 people a year die from COPD. So 10 million is, is not a number uh, to, to sniff at. That is about 3% of the U.S. population uh, not only has COPD but has bronchitis and difficulty breathing on a consistent basis just because of that. The primer, what's the primary cause of COPD? Smoking, yeah. Um, yeah, leading to 40,000 deaths a year. It's a lot. Um, asthma. Asthma is another uh, occlusive uh, respiratory disease. Uh, however, it is uh, an, an allergic response or a chronic atopic. Uh, the, term, the term atopic uh, refers to a specific type of uh, allergy. There are, there are four different, uh, from a molecular standpoint, there are four different types of allergy. Uh, and this would be a, a asthma, I believe, is a type 2 
uh, hypersensitivity. Anyways, um, some other uh, molecularly similar in terms of the pathogenesis genesis to asthma, some similar molecular uh, processes would include atopic dermatitis, uh, which is a form of eczema, atopic rhinitis, which is often called hay fever, uh, and then there are some other uh, atopic manifestations like itchy, watery eyes, or uh, there can be uh, atopic manifestations in the GI tract. <clears throat> uh, just on that point of atopic disease, uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about it, it is an aberrant, uh, it's an aberrant um, <clears throat> molecular mechanism that your body uh, uses, would use, to ward off uh, parasites. So it is m mediated by a group of T cells, of T lymphocytes, called Th2, helper T cell 2 cells. These helper T2 uh, cells are typically uh, there uh, and get activated when you come in contact with some kind of parasite, hookworm, whatever, any kind of uh, helminth out there uh, that is going to act as a parasite. Your, the Th2 cells are opposed to another group called Th1 cells, helper T cell 1 type. Those are the kind of cells that get activated during bacterial and viral infections. So you have bacterial, viral, Th1, parasites, Th2. Um, the truth is that all of us here are extremely extremely privileged in the global sense by not having to deal with parasites on a daily uh, and regular societal basis. <clears throat> but that has correlated with a rise in asthma. There is a pretty, there's a pretty famous guy that, uh, he, he was an American, he had really bad asthma, and he decided to give himself hookworm. Um, well, he couldn't get he couldn't get hookworm anywhere in the United States. He went uh, to Africa, walked around in a bunch of latrines barefoot, uh, in a bunch of cess open cesspits, and contracted uh, hookworm, and was able to fairly resolve his uh, asthma uh, due to that uh, fact. Then he came back and took uh, a fecal isolate and pulled out the hookworm from his feces and tried to start selling it, and the FDA is like, hell no. So he, <clears throat> uh, I mean, it was not feces, it was the hookworm that he had isolated from his feces. But anyways, uh, he moved to Canada, and I guess you can go to Canada and get some of this guy's hookworm if you have a really big problem with asthma. The, the idea behind it is that by giving yourself a low-grade infection with hookworm, you're sort of training that part of your immune system to do what it was meant to do uh, rather than have this part of your immune system looking around for something to deal with, finding nothing, and then uh, responding to things that it shouldn't be uh, in its environment. All of those atopic diseases I told you about, asthma, uh, hay fever, atopic dermatitis or eczema, uh, the eyes, the gut. These are all surfaces uh, that are exposed to the outside world, even the gut, you know, you eat things. And so these are surfaces uh, in which you would come in contact with parasites. Um, so that kind of is another interesting aspect of that. Took too long on that, but we'll keep going. So um, <clears throat> moving on. The uh, point of this slide is simply to point out what I had already emphasized in lab, was that there are two complete sets of vasculature in uh, the lungs. There's the pulmonary system that is bringing deoxy blood to the lungs to get oxygenated and then sending it back to the heart to be pumped to the rest of the body. There is the, the parallel but much smaller uh, vasculature of the bronchial artery and veins which are bringing uh, oxygenated blood to the cells, uh, to like the smooth muscle tissue and whatever, um, the other cells that have metabolic needs, in, in the actual bronchial tree of uh, the lungs. So that's, that's all that I'm 
getting that there. All right. So uh, in the pulmonary circuit, uh, your blood pressure is significantly lower than your systemic circuit. So you took your blood pressure uh, the other day, right? And what was your diastolic pressure, the lowest pressure that you found? It was probably anywhere from the lowest of you were around 60. Uh, there might have been some of you up around 90, something like that. Maybe, maybe someone a little higher, I hope not. Um, for for the, lo the this diastolic, the low number. Um, in your lungs, it's about 30 millimeters of mercury. Very, very low. Uh, because of that, since they are low pressure, they're more prone uh, to embolism. That is, being uh, having some kind of thing lodged in that, uh, in that pulmonary tree. Uh, it's low pressure. Things are going to get shoved up there uh, more readily. This can include blood clots, so that would be a thrombotic embolism, uh, fat globules, uh, air bubbles, really problematic. Um, yeah, so we, we have this CT scan here, and you can see uh, a number of uh, emboli indicated uh, there at the arrows. All right, so that, that's one of the hazards of having a lower, uh, actually, keep going, one more thing here, uh, having a lower blood pressure there. So um, we talked about the foramen ovale, the, the fossa ovalis in adults and in fetuses, the foramen ovale. Sometimes after birth, um, the foramen ovale doesn't seal completely, and they call it a patent foramen ovale in, in an adult. Uh, something like, I forget the number, but it's between 5 and 15 percent. No, 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 maybe, maybe it's 5 percent, and then 15 percent of pulmonary embolisms are people who have, I, I forget all the statistics, but um, anyways, a, there is a reasonable number of people out there who still have a slightly patent foramen ovale, and a patent foramen ovale is a, is, is a major cause of pulmonary embolisms particularly when you cough. So when you cough, that, the back pressure forces the flap of the foramen ovale open, and you can throw an embolus uh, into, uh, and it's a, a point of turbidity. So uh, it's, there's a high incidence of uh, thrombotic pulmonary embolism in people with uh, patent foramen ovales. <coughs> All right. So the gas exchange uh, with the blood begins in the respiratory bronchioles. These are the bronchioles just beyond the terminal bronchioles that begin to have these, uh, these alveoli in them. So here, uh, would be, uh, here would be a respiratory bronchiole. How do I know? Well, look, there's an alveola, alveolus right here adjacent to it. So it has these little bubbles off it. And it leads directly into an alveolar duct. Here are two alveolar ducts with a beautiful alveolar sac right there. That's a very nice cross-section uh, showing the anatomy. <clears throat> uh, oh, geez. OK. Um, here is a, is a cartoon of what some of these alveoli look like. So we see uh, the squamous. Uh, epithelium, uh, simple squamous epithelium uh, lining the inside. The cells are called pneumocyte type 1. Pneumocyte type 1. And the bulk of the surface area in your uh, lungs is made up of these pneumocyte uh, type 1. Um, there are also embedded around here these pneumocyte type 2 or septal cells. These uh, cells uh, are embedded in the septum between adjacent alveoli. Uh, at nodes, at the nodal regions, you're going to have the capillaries that are bringing uh, blood into the region. And then in the septa, you're going to have uh, these, these septal cells. The job of the septal cells is to produce a surfactant, an oily uh, an oily secretion of proteins and phospholipids whose job it is is to uh, reduce the surface tension. So when you take a droplet of water 
and you put it on uh, any, typically any surface, a glass or your skin or wherever, it's going to beat up, right, because of the surface tension. Well, you don't want water beating up on the surface of the squamous epithelium in the lungs. Why? What do you think, Alex? You're, you're a clever guy. What do you think? Why? What would be a, what, what's, what's the purpose of these alveoli, first of all? Well, filter is maybe not quite the right word. The word you're probably looking for is exchange. Uh, exchange. Help them out, somebody. Gas exchange. Gas exchange, okay. And um, if gas exchange is our primary purpose, uh, say I want to exchange, um, let's we'll think of gas like money. I want to exchange uh, money with Amanda over here. I want to give her, I want to give her a dollar because she did so well in her quiz. Uh, is it easier for me to do that from over here or if I walked uh, back there next to Kelsey and, and, and gave her the dollar? Much easier if I was closer, right? And so <clears throat> what could be an uh, unintended consequence of having a big droplet of water? All right, so... Here's the blood that has the oxygen in it, or that has the blood cells in it, and here's the airspace that has the oxygen in it. What happens if I have a big water droplet sitting there? I have to, the oxygen has to diffuse through the water droplet first before it can get into the blood. That is not very helpful. We want to get the air right next to, to the, the blood, the capillaries, so there can be that rapid exchange. See? Okay. So we have to keep the surface tension of water down. And by doing that, we have this oily secretion. It's not totally oily, all right, because uh, it, if it were, the water would be completely repelled by it. It's something that the water is, is missable with the water, all right? It's missable with the water and thus uh, breaks up the uh, surface tension of, of the water so that we keep the surface moist but a very, very thin layer of water, not a thick, beaded, high surface ten tension area, okay? Um, what else is there? Okay. So, this, this respiratory membrane, this is... So here we are in the alveolar airspace, and here's the inside of the blood vessel. Here's a big, giant red blood cell with its hemoglobin that we're going to load up. Uh, and this is a really thin uh, membrane. We have a single squamous capillary epithelium here, and a single pneumocyte 1 uh, squamous epithelium here, with just the thinnest amount of basement membrane keeping the two of them across. This distance is only five half of a, a micrometer, pardon me, 0.5, half a micrometer. That's two one hundred thousandths of an inch, or less than two one hundred thousandths of an inch. Really, really thin. Uh, and so this air is able, the oxygen is able to diffuse across that membrane so rapidly because this is such a short distance. This is not a very uh, long way for the oxygen, the gas, to diffuse. All right, so there are two processes. There's external re respiration and internal respiration. Uh, we, I'm going to talk about external in a moment. Internal respiration, I talked about briefly during the muscle chapter when I talked about aerobic metabolism. So that's how the cell uses oxygen in the cell itself in your peripheral tissues. Uh, we're going to hit that again in, when we get to the uh, GI chapter. But uh, external uh, respiration is our topic today. Uh, there are three parts to it. First is ventilation, pulmonary ventilation. That's getting the air into the lungs, fresh air into the lungs, and then uh, pushing the excess CO2 out. 
The second is then gas diffusion across that thin respiratory membrane in the alveoli. And once that happens, then we just have to get the oxygen to the cells, transport uh, through the body, and that's the job of the hemoglobin in the blood. All right. Once we get it there, uh, then we get into this whole internal respiration, and that's the metabolism inside of a cell. A couple definitions. Uh, external, abnormal external respiration is dangerous. Dangerous. Hypoxia. Uh, hypoxia is uh, the state of having low oxygen uh, in your tissue, low oxygen levels in your tissue. Uh, anoxia is a complete lack of oxygen. Having something, uh, tissue that becomes anoxic can become ischemic. That is uh, tissue damage due to uh, anoxia. And then uh, finally, apnea is a temporary cessation of breathing uh, during sleep. And this can be um, a result of central apnea, like some sort of regulatory control thing in the, in the medulla is off and you have central apnea or you can have um, uh, peripheral apnea because you have adenoids the size of golf balls and tonsils the size of grapes. Um, so, and that, that leads to snoring. Uh, people also have palate problems uh, that can give them uh, snoring. These people have really, really poor uh, sleep and it affects their life in a lot of ways. They get these BiPAP things on their face. They look like, uh, they sound like Darth Vader. Speaking of which, Here's some Star Wars for you. All right, Boyle's Law. Um, Boyle's Law, is anybody here on the Woodsman's team? Nope. Well, the Woodsman's team is uh, PV equals NRT is their motto. God only knows they keep it a well-guarded secret. Um, but it is the ideal gas law. It's the ideal gas law. This Boyle's law is one of the components of the ideal gas law, uh, and it's this uh, relationship between pressure and volume. So pressure is inversely related to volume. If you're holding the temperature constant and the amount of material in the container constant, if you increase the, temp uh, the pressure, you have decreased the volume. Okay, and vice versa. So uh, in the top panel, we see a decrease in volume and the pressure rises, uh, much like these guys, Han and Leia, are feeling here in the trash compactor. As the volume closes, the pressure's going up on them. And then uh, Luke here out on his home planet uh, in the great wide open, he's feeling so nice and peaceful watching the dual sunset. Uh, so as the volume goes up, uh, the pressure goes down. Pressure measured simply as number of impacts uh, by particles on the wall of the container. All right? It's the impact of the particles pushing on the wall of the container that we register as pressure. Uh, and the larger the volume, the further in a given amount of time a particle has to travel between impacts on uh, the, the, the wall of the container. All right? and you make it you make it smaller, it has less uh, distance to travel, it has more impacts per time, you increase, uh, you increase the, the pressure. All right? um, so that's that. And th this is relevant because uh, this is uh, related to ventilation. How do we move air in and out of the lungs? Well, we change the pr by changing the pressure in the lungs. Uh, to bring air into the lungs, we want to make the relative pressure in the lungs less than the pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure. How do we do that? How do we lower pressure? Do I lower pressure by increasing the volume of the lungs or decreasing the volume of the lungs? Increasing. Yeah, we just increase the volume of the lungs, thus decreasing the pressure in the, in the lungs. And since the pressure is higher, in the atmosphere, that just forces air into the lungs. And then conversely, uh, to drive air from the lungs, 
we compress the lungs, increasing the pressure above uh, atmospheric pressure, forcing air out of the lungs. <clears throat> so here uh, is a depiction of that. And that's primarily achieved, uh, the biggest uh, thing is by the action of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm uh, contracts, uh, increases the volume of the lungs, air flows in, uh, the diaphragm releases, other muscles take over and decreases the volume of the lungs and we drive air out. I put this in here just because I teach yoga and <clears throat> it's not just about moving that diaphragm. Uh, the abdomen plays a significant role as well. Uh, as this diaphragm moves down, it's moving into the abdominal space. If you can make more room in the abdomen uh, for these viscera that are getting pushed out of the way as you breathe, then you're going to be able to uh, move that diaphragm further down the abdominal uh, compartment. So by uh, pushing the belly out, the back, pushing, pressing down on what's called the pelvic diaphragm. It's not a complete diaphragm as the thoracic diaphragm is, but there is, uh, there is a, a membranous sheet uh, of, of <clears throat> a sort of a sling uh, that is uh, at the pelvic boundary. <clears throat> it helps increase the volume. Oops. In the uh, in the abdomen and aids in uh, ventilation. So um, this is just a diagram showing pressure and volume changes during inhalation and exhalation. Um, <clears throat> during inhalation, the pressure goes down uh, and the volume is going up. All right. And then during exhalation, uh, well, let's start down here, actually. The volume goes down. We compress the volume. Pressure goes up until it pushes the air out uh, into, the, uh, into the surrounding environment. So here are some of the other muscles besides the diaphragm uh, that are involved in this. We have the abdominal muscles here. Uh, some of which are not shown. So during inhalation, however, it is this process of lifting. It's lifting the rib cage and depressing the diaphragm. So we lift the rib cage with the serratus and the, and the pec minor and some of these intercostal muscles. Uh, the scalene muscles in the side of your neck lift that clavicle up um, and, the, and the superior rib, uh, the top rib, uh, increasing that volume. And then on exhalation, the uh, intercostals, uh, the internal intercostals can contract and compress the rib cage, the uh, rectus abdominis, the obliques, uh, compress the abdomen, help force that diaphragm up into the, uh, into the rib cage. So here's a chart uh, that you are going to need during the metabolic analysis lab, there, it should be in that pack as well, but I'm introducing it to you now. There's this notion of pulmonary volumes. So as you're sitting there listening to me, uh, I don't think any of you are, are hyperventilating, doing any deep breathing, thinking about uh, these pulmonary volumes. So you're probably all sitting here at this uh, resting tidal volume. So uh, tidal volume is just like the tide. That's the amount of water that comes in and goes out, right? So a, tide, a, a tidal volume is just how much air you're moving between peak exhalation and peak inhalation. Um, and uh, there are these, uh, these other concepts here, which you'll, uh, I'm not going to go through right now, but you'll familiarize yourself during that lab. Uh, one of the ones I use a lot is this, the two are tidal volume and then uh, vital capacity. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that you can push. So how far in and how far out once you blow it all out. <clears throat> so tidal volume and vital capacity, those are the two important ones for the moment. All right. Uh, we talked about Boyle's law, uh, P inversely related to V. Henry's law is uh, another one. It's a relationship between solubility and pressure. 
So um, I'm sure everybody here has opened up a can of soda or seltzer water or a two liter or something like that. And as soon as that happens, whoosh, uh, you let air out, right? You, all this carbon dioxide that was in solution, was in solution, you open it up and let the pressure out and a lot of that carbon dioxide that was dissolved comes out of solution, all right? So what we're doing is we're just increasing the pressure here. This is the increased pressure. So that exchange, that equilibrium between uh, carbon dioxide that's dissolved and carbon dioxide that's uh, out in the air here is at a higher equilibrium. So you increase the pressure. Uh, here we're going to increase pressure. This, uh, these particles are going to dissolve into this fluid until it reaches an equilibrium. Now we release that pressure and there's going to be more coming out than going in and the concentration is going to decrease. Uh, this, it, it's, this is central physics that is driving the, um, the dynamics of gas exchange in our lungs and how the air is going to go into uh, solution, how the oxygen is going to dissolve into the blood and the carbon dioxide is going to dissolve out of the blood into the, into the alveolar space. All right, uh, here's this gentleman's circulatory system, conveniently tattooed on the front of his body. Um, <clears throat> looking at part of it in the lungs here, uh, we see uh, the pulmonary capillaries. So here's a pulmonary capillary. And the blood that is coming from his periphery is got uh, a partial pressure of oxygen around uh, 40 millimeters of mercury and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide around 45 uh, tor or millimeters of mercury. That's what's coming back from your tissue. Well, luckily, the partial pressure of oxygen uh, is 100 in the atmosphere is about 100 uh, tor or millimeters of mercury, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is about, as long as we don't mess it up any further with uh, carbon emissions, is uh, about 40 uh, millimeters of mercury right there. So, as you can see, uh, 45 in the blood of carbon dioxide and 40 in the atmosphere, the net motion of carbon dioxide is going to be out of the blood. Whereas the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood uh, and the deoxy blood is at 40 millimeters and it's 100 in the, uh, in the atmosphere. So there's going to be a real strong pressure to bring uh, oxygen dissolved into the blood. So then moving out of this space, the, the oxygenated blood fairly reflects uh, the, the composition, the concentration profile in the atmosphere. All right, and then the reverse thing happens at your cells. So uh, this is somewhere in the periphery down here. Uh, this blood is coming in. Uh, it's not quite at 100 any longer because some of that oxygen has been leached off by... Uh, the various structures that it's passed as it goes. CO2 is around 40 because it's not picking up any anywhere. Uh, but in the cell, the pre partial pressure of oxygen is low. It's at about 40 and CO2 is at about 45. And so we just have gas exchange in the exact same manner as we did at the alveoli. And, and, we, uh, and we start this, this cycle over again. All right. Um, So the, to get your head around this one, um, this is the ambient uh, partial pressure of oxygen. And this, so this is in the pressure gradient of oxygen. So this would be in the atmosphere, and this would be, uh, this would be the venous blood that's just arriving at the alveoli totally depleted of oxygen. So this is, um, a, a, this is the, the 
pressure gradient of oxygen. So here is a steep gradient, rapid diffusion of oxygen. Uh, this is a normal gradient at sea level. The steep gradient would be uh, if you had, you were in a uh, high pressure chamber uh, of three atmosphere that was 100% oxygen. So you were just shoving oxygen into that person's lungs. Uh, this would be really rapid, very rapid. Uh, this is where most of us are down here, atmospheric, level, uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level. Uh, and then this is a, a much slower gradient. Uh, this would be uh, like the Sherpas up in, if you were to go with the Sherpa up to the top of the Himalayas or something like that. Uh, it takes, it's much slower for oxygen to get into the blood. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about this on a more molecular level. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, we, we, we talked about it in the cardiovascular chat for just a little bit. Uh, here is the heme molecule. And heme molecule is basically this porphyrin ring, this porphyrin ring with an iron in the, in the uh, plus two oxidation state coordinated at the center of this. And this is a little bit like uh, a molecular trampoline. It's this, uh, it's not totally rigid. It's not completely rigid. It does uh, have some flex to it, right? So uh, iron, the thing about iron is it really likes to bind oxygen. So here uh, is this piece of art by this guy, Julian Voss Andre. Um, and uh, here is it when it was initially installed. And over the period of six months, you can see the iron has rusted, where the, the iron has now coordinated with oxygen and it's changed its oxidation state. That's exactly what happens here. Iron 2 plus goes from 2 plus to 3 plus as it uh, uh, coordinates with, with oxygen. So this porphyrin ring with the iron, the heme molecule, is embedded in the structure of uh, these uh, globulin uh, subunits in hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein that has four subunits, two, two alpha and two beta, and uh, it's packed into this red blood cell. Each red blood cell has about 280 million hemoglobins. So that's like a whole planet Earth. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, like a whole United States, not a planet Earth. Like a whole United States full of hemoglobins packed into a single le uh, red blood cell. And then what's the number? Was it like some? It was in the trillions, the number of red blood cells uh, that you have per uh, microliter uh, in, your, in your body, right? So you're talking about a lot of protein there. All right. So the thing about hemoglobin is that it is an allosteric, uh, it's an allosteric protein. And so the word allosteria is a generalized term that refers to uh, the change in the activity of a protein dependent upon a conformational shift that occurs after binding of some kind of effector or ligand. Okay, so an allosteric uh, enzyme. So what's a what's a what's an analogy? I should come up with an analogy. Well. Um, <laughs> struggling. I'm usually pretty good at this. Um, a car, maybe a car is a bad one, but a car is pretty much uh, an enormous paperweight without the key. You put the key in, you turn the key, you've changed, slightly changed the conformation of the car, and now the car is going to have a, a different function than it did before. Um, that's not a really good analogy. Anyways, what you can see here is... Um, uh, uh, some allosteric changes that are occurring in uh, D. So here is deoxy and then oxy. It's, it's cycling back. 
So here uh, in the oxy, you have four oxygen molecules and a change in the shape. Uh, when the oxygen comes off, there is uh, a shift in the shape of the hemoglobin and a shift in its function, and we'll see how that plays out. So here is uh, another, just looking at a single subunit, uh, the oxygen comes on and it shifts the overall conformation of that globulin. When a single globulin subunit binds oxygen, <coughs> this, this conformational shift is going to affect the other three subunits. All right, it's going to affect the other three subunits. So when I bind oxygen here, this conformational shift is going to make it easier. It's going to make it easier for the other three to bind oxygen. In fact, it's going to drive them a little bit closer to their oxy state, even though they're all deoxy. This being oxy pushes them slightly closer to their oxy state and makes the uh, activation energy barrier for oxygen to come in and bind lower. All right, so it's easier for them to bind. So each successive oxygen that binds in the four sites makes it easier for the subsequent oxygen to bind. That's called allosteria. Uh, hemoglobin was the first allosteric enzyme that uh, was identified, and it certainly is the, uh, certainly is the most well-studied. All right, so here, here is a chart showing this. So let's, let's understand this chart, because this, uh, th this encapsulates a lot of this, this whole idea. Uh, along here, uh, we have percent from 0 to 100, percent saturation. So this is out of the bulk of your blood, all of the hemoglobin, what percent of the possible binding sites are full? Okay, what percent? Uh, so here at 50% uh, saturation. That means 50% of all of the molecule, all of the hemoglobin, all of the, what should I say, 50% of all of the porphyrin rings are bound to iron, okay? That does not mean that all of the hemoglobin looks like this. It doesn't mean that all of it has only two oxygens. It means that out of a group of four, uh, maybe two of them look like this, one of them may only have one oxygen on it, and another may have three. Another may have none, and a, and a fourth may have all of the sites. It just means that 50% of the sites are full, okay? Um, along, this, along this axis here, uh, we have partial pressure of oxygen, all right? <clears throat> so this is uh, the, the partial pressure of dissolved oxygen that this hemoglobin is experiencing, all right? Um, and this ranges from zero, and it, it, keep, it can keep going up, but it just happens to end at 100 here because why? Why is this percent? No, this is not percent. Why is this end at 100? Atmospheric. That's the atmospheric partial pressure of oxygen. Remember I showed uh, the partial pressure of oxygen. So, um, and the, the, re the important range is from here to here. So your systemic tissue, uh, your peripheral tissue is at about 40 millimeters of mercury, and your alveoli uh, is about 100 millimeters of mercury. So this is the range we're working in. This red line shows the saturation of hemoglobin in your blood uh, in response to uh, the, the partial pressure of oxygen. And this is where we're typically working. So up here, as you get uh, near, as you get near, if, this is not a straight line. Uh, if this was a straight line, it would be no allosteria. The shape, the curve of this line uh, is due to uh, the allosteria. What's interesting about this 
is even at the peripheral tissues, when we have unloaded all of the oxygen that's going to be unloaded, still 75% of the sites, 75% of the possible sites on the blood are still full of oxygen. All right, this is an oxygen reserve that we have. Maybe we're drowning uh, and we're, we're, we're getting pushed this way. There's still a lot of oxygen. There's still a lot of oxygen to release off that hemoglobin. All right? Um, yeah, so up to three quarters of dissolved oxygen may be reserved by the red blood cells. Um, what is, it, what is uh, essential about this is that at higher concentrations of oxygen, oxygen uh, hemoglobin wants to bind more, and at lower concentrations of oxygen, hemoglobin wants to dump oxygen. So this is really convenient. When the hemoglobin finds itself in a place of high oxygen con uh, concentration, a.k.a. the lungs, it is more tuned to grab up the oxygen quickly. However, when the hemoglobin finds itself in the periphery, where there's a lower oxygen concentration, it's more geared to letting go of oxygen, which is what we wanted to do there. Does that make sense? So we're changing the function of the uh, hemoglobin to match the two environments that it, that it has to function in. One of the, it has two jobs. Hemoglobin does not have one job, it has two jobs. One of its jobs is to pick up oxygen at the lungs in a high oxygen concentration place. Its other job is to let go of oxygen in a low oxygen environment. And we're tuning it so that it, is, it doesn't have a linear response. It can be better at uh, doing both of those jobs independently because it never has to do both those jobs at the same time, right? It would never find itself at, in a high oxygen concentration and a low oxygen concentration environment at the same time, right? Does that make sense a little bit? Okay. So that curve, that oxygen saturation curve that you say, uh, that we just looked at, uh, can be affected by a number of different uh, parameters. It can be affected by pH. This is called the Bohr effect, named after this guy with the mustache here, uh, Christian Bohr. Um, and uh, it can be affected by temperature. All right. Um, so let's look at the Bohr effect first. What did I say the normal pH range of the blood was? 7.4 is the mid. So it's 7.45 down to 7.35. It's a pretty narrow range, right, that you feel comfortable in. Um, so if you are in acidosis at 7.35, right over here, all right, let's look at what's going to happen. Okay, so this, let's, let's call this 40% right here, 40%. Um, acidosis that's when you have high carbonic acid, high CO2 in your blood, maybe high lactic acid, right? You've been exercising really strenuously, anaerobically, high acidosis. Um, it shifts the curve, it shifts the curve uh, so that um, O2 release at the tissue, okay, wait, wait. Uh, it shifts the curve such that uh, it, it's more readily dumping oxygen. It's easier for it to dump oxygen at the peripheral uh, at the peripheral tissues. So at uh, forty at forty percent saturation, or I'm sorry, at forty uh, millimeters of mercury, which is the peripheral tissue. When you're in acidosis, when you're normal, you're here at about seventy-five. When you're in acidosis, the saturation drops down to sixty. See that? 
So more of the oxygen has come off the hemoglobin when you're in acidosis. The oxygen is dipping into that reserve. So normal is here at 75, go into acidosis, you dip down into that reserve of oxygen and you release more of the oxygen. Uh, that, is, that is the Bohr effect. Tip. CO2, when it go, dissolves in, uh, in the blood, can form either uh, bicarbonate or it can form carbonic acid. So typically, just CO2 uh, directly dissolved uh, forms carbonic acid, which becomes acidic. Yes. All right. So <clears throat> this plays out in terms of fetal hemoglobin. And I, I love this. I, I would love to teach a class just about development uh, and the and the amazing physiology of fetuses, embryos and fetuses, because that whole, from, from conception up through uh, thymic deletion and, and breastfeeding, it's just incredible, uh, the mechanisms of it. So here is some fetal hemoglobin. Adult hemoglobin has these four subunits, alpha and beta. However, fetal hemoglobin, the beta subunits are replaced by these uh, gamma subunits. They're different. The proteins are different in babies. Um, and uh, gamma, gamma globulin has a higher affinity for oxygen than uh, the beta subunits. All right? Because of that, it shifts the curve. It shifts this curve over in the opposite direction. Okay? So here's the normal saturation curve. And here's the fetal hemoglobin saturation curve. OK. Why? Why is that? Why is that? Can anybody tell me the rest of the story? Anybody puzzle out why babies want to do this? Infant, not infants, fetuses in utero connected to their mother by the umbilicus through the placenta. Exactly. Thank you. So um, at this peripheral tissue here, let's, let's just, this is the concentration at the placenta, we'll say. Uh, here is the fetus, and here's the adult. At this concentration of oxygen, which is what we're going to find at the placenta, the mother is at 75% saturation. But the fetal hemoglobin wants to be up here around 90. So it's going to rip oxygen off of the mother's hemoglobin. You need the baby's hemoglobin. Uh, it, it needs to be stronger than the mother's, or it would never take oxygen off the mother's hemoglobin. All right? It needs to be stronger. It needs to be stronger. Uh, and so uh, it the curve gets shifted by having different uh, subunits of globulin in there, hemoglobin. Uh, this is why sometimes uh, when babies are born, they, they're, they look a little yellow uh, after a couple days because a baby gets born and suddenly they don't need alpha-gamma hemoglobin anymore. They need alpha-beta. And they need to break down all that hemoglobin that they've been using for nine months or actually probably about uh, seven, six months, something like that. And um, those gamma globulin subunits uh, and the heme that's in them get turned over. Uh, I, I told you that uh, Billy Rubin and Billy Verdin are made from the breakdown of hemoglobin and when we were looking at the Cori cycle. And I also told you that bilirubin is the chromophore that gives you jaundice uh, when you have liver dysfunction, because all that happens in the liver. Uh, so babies look a little bit yellow uh, right in the beginning. Sometimes, not all of them, sometimes they do, because they're turning over an enormous amount of fetal hemoglobin uh, early on, because they're trying to switch their... Yeah, Amanda. Oh, no. Yeah, I was just wondering... Why, why do some babies have, like, severe 
Um, I don't know what you mean by severe, but if, if it's if it's the jaundice that's related to this, and sometimes it can be very yeah, they can be very yellow. Uh, it, it's exactly because of this. Maybe they're having uh, maybe the for that individual maybe the the process of turning over fetal hemoglobin happen is happening more rapidly than it's happened than it happens in other individuals. Uh, it, it may just be happening all at once for some reason. Um, yeah, just the time course. It's I believe it's just the time course of that of that uh, that conversion from fetal to adult hemoglobin um, or postpartum hemo hemoglobin. Uh, when those that when that happens to those children, uh, they uh, they need sunlight. They need exposure to UV light uh, because vitamin D three is uh, involved in that in that process of conversion. Uh, yeah, James. What's the point of converting it from genetic to human? Like, why do you need to change it when it's already more beneficial? Uh, it's not necessarily more beneficial uh, because look at their. So let's look at what the, what the range babies are working in. Uh, babies. So here with an adult, you're, you go from seventy-five percent saturation out to 100% saturation, right, or about 98% saturation. So you have a dynamic range of 25% saturation, right? Babies are only working with about 8% dynamic range, all right? They're only working with about 8% dynamic range. They're not able to actually transport as much blood, uh, as, as much oxygen as adults are. It's okay. They're not doing much. They're hooked up in there to a constant supply of oxygen. They're not running around. They don't have a huge amount of tissue uh, to deal with, uh, right? So, uh, but with an adult, when you, you become an adult, uh, you want to be able to have that extra carrying capacity of oxygen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for an adult, this is a much better, is a much better deal. This this stuff wins in a battle for holding on to oxygen. It wants to bind oxygen more than this stuff, right? So it rips the oxygen away, but it's not as good at doing this thing that I talked about, the two jobs, the binding oxygen and then letting go of oxygen, right? It's not as good at doing the two different jobs as adult uh, hemoglobin is, right? Like more of this oxygen uh, that's in fetal blood is staying on the hemoglobin and less of it is being released uh, to the peripheral tissues. So it's, it's not advantageous to have it when you are uh, out in the daylight. Okay. Yeah. Th uh, what was it? Three weeks ago was the 20th anniversary of the death of a friend of mine who uh, was the recording engineer that recorded uh, an album that I was in a band and, and he recorded the album. He, yeah, he, he died from carbon monoxide poisoning. So hemoglobin doesn't just bind oxygen. The iron will coordinate all kinds of things uh, like carbon uh, monoxide. And in fact, carbon monoxide has a binding constant for uh, the heme molecule that is 200 times larger uh, than that of, of oxyhemoglobin. So that means once a hemoglobin gets on, it's 200 times more likely to stay there than an oxygen is. So if you are being chronically exposed to carbon monoxide, uh, you are basically just taking a whole swath uh, of of hemoglobin out of circulation. That carbon monoxide is not coming off very easily, and you're basically inactivating your hemoglobin, functionally decreasing the amount of hemoglobin that your body has, decreasing your oxygen carrying capacity. People get stressed out. Uh, again, I promised myself I wouldn't ask anybody uh, in the class if they smoked, but, uh, you know, I used to uh, teach uh, when we lived in Texas. Uh, I, I taught at a community college down there for a few semesters, and there's a lot of smokers in that class, which is why that BMI data I gave you has that crazy upper end on it. 
um, if you remember some of the, the, the bigger uh, BMIs and arterial pressures. Uh, these, these, these kids would go out in front of the building right before the test and just suck down about two or three cigarettes to get themselves ready to go into class and take this test. That is like the worst thing you could do before a test. Uh, maybe, maybe you think it calms your nerves, but really it's reducing your capacity to have oxygen to your brain, which is what you need to be doing a test. So carbon monoxide um, uh, results from in uh, sufficiently oxygen starved combustion is what it is, is what it's from um, so uh, this is looking what these are is a successive uh, series of sa oxygen saturation curves uh, where uh, this is what the oxygen saturation curve looks like in a normal person with no carbon monoxide then if 20% of the carbon monoxide uh, affects your um, hemoglobin, you are already down in the, in the real negative region. You're having a hard time breathing right here, really hard time transporting oxygen. Any more than about 25% uh, carbon monoxide saturation, and you're done. Um, so uh, it, it can be a real dangerous problem. It's not like getting a dose of it and then just shaking it off and, and holding your breath and waiting, you know, breathing deep and waiting for it to go away. It, it has a, a really long dwell time there. All right, so how do we <clears throat> transport carbon dioxide in the blood? Um, so first off, carbon dioxide diffuses into the bloodstream from the peripheral tissue. Um, and uh, about 7% of it is just carbon dioxide dissolved in the blood, unchanged. Uh, about the bulk of it, however, uh, enters the red blood cells, and 23% uh, of it is going to bind uh, to hemoglobin. So carbon dioxide also binds to the unoccupied heme molecules uh, in carbamo. Uh, carbamino, pardon me, carbamino hemoglobin. 70% uh, of it is converted uh, to carbonic acid by carb uh, carbonic anhydrase, uh, and this dissociates uh, into the carbonate and the H plus ion, thus acidifying uh, the blood. This gets shuttled out of uh, the hemoglobin by this chloride antiporter, uh, which keeps a net neutrality. And this stuff just moves, uh, it just moves through the bloodstream. Uh, this stuff uh, just gets buffered uh, by the blood, the, the hemoglobin predominantly. So those are the different ways it can travel. It either dissolves this carbon dioxide uh, as bound hemoglobin, or it can convert it to uh, carbonic acid and buffered and, and shuttled out into the blood in exchange for chloride. All right, <clears throat> so let's review. This is a review slide. Oxygen comes in at the alveoli here, uh, enters the hemoglobin. A little bit goes in the blood. Most of it binds to hemoglobin. Uh, gets transported through the, the circulatory system. Uh, oxygen diffuses out into the peripheral tissue. All right, then we have carbon dioxide uh, coming in. Some of it goes through uh, the carbonic anhydride, chloride uh, shift, and then the rest of it is just uh, carbamino hemoglobin. Transferred back to the lungs. Uh, this is 45 the, in, uh, millimeters of mercury CO2. This is 40 millimeters of mercury CO2 uh, diffuses out into the lungs and is expelled in your breath. Uh, where is this carbon? Where is this carbon dioxide coming from? Where did that carbon come from originally? Glucose. What's that? Glucose. Glucose, the food that you eat. All right. Uh, chemoreceptors, the peripheral chemoreceptors. Um, I've shown you this sort of thing here a couple times this semester. Uh, the aortic bodies and the carotid bodies uh, 
uh, are sending fibers up along the vagus nerve uh, to the um, to the brain stem. Uh, they are monitoring uh, the pH of the blood. They're monitoring the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, um, and then responding uh, appropriately. So here's the homeostatic. That that was the sensors. Here's the uh, homeostatic pathway. So uh, let's start with normal uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and uh, and then we'll uh, increase uh, the, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. We call this hypercapnia. Hypercapnia. This is a low pH, high concentration of carbon dioxide. Well, what do we do? Uh, these uh, chemoreceptors that I just showed you get turned on, uh, and uh, this is going to send uh, stimulus to the dorsal respiratory group, in, basically into the brain stem. Uh, and then there's also a direct stimulation in the brain stem uh, uh, by PO, uh, PCO2. This uh, increases your breathing rate, uh, and by increasing your breathing rate, you're trying to eliminate carbon dioxide. So I'm doing some kind of activity here. I'm not breathing heavily. I'm building up carbon dioxide. The brain says, oh, no, there's too much carbon dioxide. <sighs> it's going to start uh, increasing my rate of breath, not just to deliver CO2, but also to blow off carbon dioxide. Uh, CO2 goes down, homeostasis return. And it's just the opposite here. So uh, <clears throat> hypocapnia or a uh, too little CO2 in the blood. Uh, this inhibits the chemoreceptors and reduces stimulation in the brainstem. Uh, this parallel direct pathway to the CNS also has the same effect. And this slows your breath down. Uh, and you have a decreased elimination of CO2, stabilizing the blood pH um, and returning you to normal. So this would be an example of so right here, this is like acidosis, uh, exercise. Here is alkalosis. This would be like intentionally hyperventilating, um, intentionally drawing carbon dioxide off the blood by <sighs> makes you feel weird. And you stop, and then your, your respiratory rate uh, becomes very slow. All right. I'm going to be able to let you out five minutes early today, I think. But before I do, I'm going to uh, hit on this theme that I've already talked about a little bit today, the truly gross anatomy of smoker's lungs. Um, here is a mortality chart. Uh, respiratory performance versus age. And, uh, and this is how your, your lung capacity uh, goes if you've never smoked, all right? So here, uh, you're at about 60% lung capacity of being a healthy 25-year-old uh, at the age of 85 or whatever. Uh, however, a regular smoker, this goes down precipitously. Whenever you stop, the arc, the general arc of this uh, matches what uh, it would be if you never smoked. So you've stopped doing the damage uh, due to the smoking, it's, you can never quite recover what you've damaged, uh, but at least you're not adding uh, more to the more fuel to the fire. Um, so then and you see here for a smoker, it, it significantly reduces life expectancy and uh, and uh, respiratory performance. Um, so estimated attributable portion of lung cancer cases by cause. 90% of deaths are due to active smoking. 15 uh, is due to carcinogen uh, from occupational hazards. 10% from radon. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't quite understand how these numbers add up. But uh, anyways, radon is, is a real problem, outdoor air pollution. Uh, this is what your lungs look like. And healthy, not healthy. Um, this number is, is, is actually uh, a little bit, is about three years out of date. I should uh, try to up, get more recent figures. Um, it's probably closer to about uh, 13, 14 billion right now. 
Uh, $14 billion per year is spent in the United States on lung cancer treatment alone. Uh, that is a significant portion of our national GDP. It's a significant portion of the national GDP. Uh, it is dwarfed by the cost of uh, metabolic disorder, which we'll talk about, but it's still huge. Just lung cancer, this one problem, is a huge amount of money, a huge drain on the economy. Um, so cancer deaths uh, by type compared here. Uh, lung cancer is equal to this in number to the next four other cancers combined, prostate, pancreas, breast, and colon cancer, all together uh, equal uh, deaths by lung cancer. And so in, in 2012, uh, that we had almost 160,000 deaths for lung cancer. In fact, it was 160,000 deaths uh, in 2012 uh, due to lung cancer. It's a lot of people dying. That's a lot of people dying. All right. Um, a lot of Mainers are in that number. Uh, so here, and this is not a, a problem of just men. I mean, there's the like gender stereotype of, of the tough guy, the, the Marlboro man with a cigarette in his mouth. Uh, but I guess one of the downsides of, of gender reform in our country is that it's become much more acceptable for females uh, and much more accept, more importantly, much more acceptable for tobacco companies to market to females, uh, and the, the increase in female smoking. So even while uh, the number for men has gone down, uh, less men are uh, dying of lung cancer. Less men are, are beginning to smoke. Uh, more women are are dying from uh, lung cancer. Maybe the number looks like it's leveling off. I don't know. This is 2008. That's actually a pretty old chart. But still, we have eight years of data or five years, seven years of data there to add. But, um, yeah, it's a problem. Okay. So were there any questions? To recap, I actually didn't really go over the respiratory, respiratory anatomy that much. Uh, I talked about the mechanics of ventilation. I then talked about the physics of gas exchange. Uh, and then I spent what I consider to be, uh, I spent a good amount of time on what I consider to be the most important part of the chapter, which is saturation dynamics of hemoglobin. Uh, talked a little bit about carbon dioxide transport, and finally, I uh, tried to convince you to stop smoking. I, nobody in this class smokes. I don't want to know if you do. Um, okay. Is anybody coming to yoga today? Just so I know. You would like to. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. I'll see you tomorrow.